joining us virtually online. Glad that you have chosen to worship with us at Augusta Heights or with Augusta Heights as the case may be. Uh, and if this is one of your first times being here or your first time being here, or if you would just like to receive more information and get our weekly email updates, there are visitors cards that are in the pews. Uh, you can fill one of those out, even if you just give your name or email address. Uh, we can add you to that weekly email list, and we are happy to be of support, be of service in any way that we can. And you can drop those in the offering plate when they come around later in the service. Uh, you will also notice in your bulletin a green insert. Uh, that is a list of all of the poinsettias that were uh, donated in memory or in honor of others. Uh, there are some lovely dedications there. There are also some humorous ones for 
my seven-year-old daughter's favorite baseball player. Uh, so uh, we are glad to have those around the bases of our trees and out in the vestibules. Uh, and if you donated those, this list will be printed again for our Christmas Eve service. And you can actually take those home after our Christmas Eve service and share those with loved ones or uh, just have them adorn your home. We also have on this Christmas tree our angel tree for this year. We have, uh, I believe it's 24 names of uh, uh, children, families who might need a little extra support, who receive ongoing support through social workers and guidance counselors and ongoing ministries that we partner with through our church, uh, but just can use a little extra holiday cheer during this time of the year. So feel free to take one of those. There are sign-up sheets, so make sure you write your name by the number of the angel. Uh, there are some clipboards with those and also on this table over here. And Chuck and Rhonda Childs have coordinated that for us. So if you have any questions, you can let them know. Also, we have a few events coming up that we would love for you to be a part of. Our senior adult ministry is gathering on Tuesday the 14th for Ball Club. Be active, live longer. We'll be getting together for a Christmas meal at the K&S restaurant. So if you would like more information or to RSVP, you can contact Juanita Mullinax uh, or contact the church office and we will make sure we get your spot. We also have a drop-in at my house, actually, uh, on December the 19th for all of our church committee members, um, all of our church leadership. That will be Sunday afternoon, uh, two weeks from today, from 3 to 5 p.m. And again, if you need more information, just contact us and let us know. In terms of uh, giving, uh, again, a big thank you for your generosity as we near the end of the year. We just barely missed our November goal. So it's just a reminder to help us finish the year strong uh, and just a reminder as well that any financial gifts, whether they come in the form of a check or through PayPal or whatever, have to be in by December 30th in order to count for this year so that we can do all of the accounting from our end. And also a reminder that if you are planning to pledge toward our Renew Capital Campaign, and I certainly hope that you will, and you haven't gotten those pledges in already, uh, please do that by the end of the year. That is our goal, and that helps us to move ahead with our financing and groundbreaking and all of the wonderful work that we are going to be doing. So if you need extra pledge cards, let us know. We actually have some up here at the front of the church. You can drop those in the offering plate, mail them in, drop them by the church office, whatever is easiest. And if you have any questions at all about how to give or how the pledging works, please don't hesitate to reach out. I also want to give you a heads up for what is happening in the new year in January. So pre-COVID, we had a number of vibrant Bible study and Sunday school classes on Sunday mornings and at other times as well. We have been kind of slowly rolling those back out and we are looking to really start back with a lot of those in January. So we've started back our children's Sunday school. We had a pastor Sunday school class uh, that ran for a couple of months this fall. Uh, we have other groups that meet monthly, an evolving faith group, a pride group, a men's group, a women's group, so all kinds of different gatherings. Well, in January, throughout the month of January, on Sunday mornings at 9.30, we invite you to come for coffee and conversation. Uh, we will gather around the conference room in the chapel where the coffee pots are. We'll have muffins or donuts, and it will be a time we'll have some prompts for discussion if you'd like them, but it's really just a time to be together and reacquaint ourselves with one another, get to know some new folks as well. So we would love to have you join us. That'll be each Sunday in January. And then as that grows and evolves, we will continue to start other Bible study groups and stuff on Sunday mornings as well, a little bit smaller groups. We're also going to have supper clubs that will be starting in January, uh, a book club that will be starting in January. So we're looking forward to really getting back together and getting back to being uh, a full fellowship in the new year. Speaking of our fellowship, we do want to keep in our minds and in our prayers some folks among us who uh, are going through difficult times or celebrating. We celebrate the fact that David Blondo had his double knee replacement, and he is at home now doing his recovery, and that seems to be going well. So keep him and Deb in your prayers. Uh, we want to keep Pearl Kelly in our prayers. Um, she is under hospice care 
Uh, she is still at Oakview uh, um, Assisted Living and will remain there, but uh, has some caregivers who are coming in there. So keep Pearl in your prayers as well, one of our longtime church members. Uh, we're glad to see Benny Killingsworth back with us and doing well. He had two stints put in last Sunday, so just a week out and already back with us. Um, we want to remember Roy Gullick's mother-in-law, Sarah's mother, uh, Catherine Trailer. Uh, she is under hospice care now in Kingsport, Tennessee, and Sarah is there with her. So please keep their family in your prayers as well. And amazing thing, Ken Frazier, our oldest living church member, turns 106 on Friday. And I know that he would love getting all the cards and all the notes. So if you would like his address, I know some of you have already reached out and asked for that. Um, please send him a card or if you would like contact information, uh, we'll be happy to share that with you. Just let us know. Uh, but he turns 106 on Friday, so let's definitely show him some love. Again, we are glad that you are here to worship with us on this second Sunday of Advent, this Sunday of peace. So let us worship together. Right. Yes. About that. Oh, yes. Thank you. I hadn't written that down because it was so recent. Don Hawkins, who we have been praying for, grew up in the church. Nancy's brother, Susan Self's brother, uh, has been awaiting a heart transplant for months and months and months and just got it. And he is doing well. Um, heart is doing well. So we celebrate and give thanks for that. And we also want to offer prayers for the family of the donor, um, because that doesn't happen without the loss of another's life. And so we pray for them and hold them in our prayers, even as we give thanks for Don's healing that comes through that. Okay, so now let us worship together. Please join me in the call to worship found in your bulletin. If life was a home, then we would pray. May love be the foundation and God the cornerstone. May the spirit be the windows ushering light in. May hope be the walls holding us all together. In this time of worship, let us build that home together. We may not know every detail of the blueprints, but God is here. Let us give thanks for the foundation of love. And let us worship with the God of peace. As we reflect on the foundation of our faith in our lives, we gather together around the candle of peace. The home we belong, the home we long for is a home that knows peace. Peace that rests between us and our grief, peace around our anxiety, peace between us and our self-criticism, peace amidst our relationships, peace at the core of our being peace hovering through and in our world. The home we long for is a home that knows peace. So today we light the candle of peace as a reminder and as a prayer. Let it be so. Amen. <laughs>
Now let's all stand and sing our opening hymn, O Little Town of Bethlehem, number 86. something like a house or a building what 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 does it take to build something blueprints you need a blueprint yes okay yes but what about the like the actual objects what actual objects it takes to build up materials yes what kind of materials yates bricks bricks a crane. You might need a crane if you're building a really, really tall building. Cash? Um, like, um, construction vehicles. Yes, absolutely. Rivers? Um, a saw. A saw? Wood. Wood? To like tools. Yes, Wyatt? Uh, we're going to get to that. We're going to get to that in just a second. We're Yes, absolutely. We're going to talk about that piece of building something, but we're talking about a building. And building something takes nails and hammers and cranes, wood, all of that. So one thing that we can build that doesn't take all of that, doesn't take a hammer, doesn't take a nail, is friendships and relationships that help build a community. A community like the church here at Augusta Heights. Maybe the, maybe the community maybe in your neighborhood or your school. We build these communities by being there for one another, by having friendships with one another, by teaching one another things, by listening, by, by being there when someone needs you by helping one another and having peace, yes. 
This building of a community is so important because we need each other. We need each other to feel that peace that Wyatt is talking about. So this morning I'm going to read one of the scripture passages and then I'm going to ask you those wondering questions that we talked about last week when we think about them in our head. So this is what Paul wrote to his friends in the city of Philippi while he was in prison for teaching about Jesus. I thank God for the help you gave me while I preached the good news. You helped from the first day you believed until now. God began doing a work in you, and he will continue until it is finished. When Jesus Christ comes again, I am sure of that. So now I'm going to ask you to think about these wondering questions inside your head. I wonder how Paul's friends helped him. I wonder whether Paul helped start the good work he talks about. I wonder what good work God is doing in you. I wonder who is helping you right now. I wonder what kind of person you will grow into. So the good news for today is that we are always growing your family, your church, and your teachers are all helping you to learn and grow into the person that God has created you to be. Will you pray with me? Dear God, we are so glad to always grow and learn and change. Thank you for the people in our lives who are, have laid a good, solid foundation for us to build upon. It is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. <laughs>
us pray. Heavenly Father, help us to be generous givers, both of our money and our time. We give our offerings with an eager heart, not as a comparison with others, but as an act of worship to you. Bless these tithes and offerings to support the ministry of this church and our community. May we find the comfort we desire in you and the strength we need in your name. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. I forgot to announce that uh, one of our church members, Benny Killingsworth, is in the Greenville Gay Men's Chorus, and they have their big concert on Friday night at First Baptist Church of Greenville, and it is free. So, please go. Now for our scripture reading. Our passage this morning is actually the words of Zechariah, the father of John the Baptist. Zechariah is the very first character we meet in Luke's gospel story. He's a priest, a righteous man married to Elizabeth, but the couple has no children, and both were getting on in years, as the gospel writer so delicately puts it. One day, while he is serving in the temple, an angel, Gabriel, appeared to Zechariah, telling him that they would have a son, and to name him John, and that this boy would be filled with the Holy Spirit even before he is born, and he would be a prophet for God. Now, Zechariah was a bit skeptical, given his and Elizabeth's age, and Gabriel didn't take too kindly to that. So he takes his divine remote and points it at Zechariah and hits the mute button until this child is born. But now, after months and months of silence, after months and months of pregnancy, their son has been born. And as they are naming him, finally, Zechariah is able to speak. People are amazed at all of these events surrounding the birth and wonder, what will this child become? And right on cue, Zechariah, himself filled with the Holy Spirit, answers them with these words. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has looked favorably upon his people and redeemed them. He has raised up a mighty Savior for us in the house of his servant David, as he spoke through the mouth of his holy prophets from of old, that we would be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us. 
Thus, he has shown the mercy promised to our ancestors and has remembered his holy covenant, the oath that he swore to our ancestor Abraham, to grant us that we, being rescued from the hands of our enemies, might serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all our days. And you, child, will be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation to his people by the forgiveness of their sins. By the tender mercy of our God, the dawn from on high will break upon us to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the way of peace. And the child grew and became strong in spirit, and he was in the wilderness until the day he appeared publicly to Israel. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Now, despite the title of today's sermon, I know nothing about construction. I have to confess that most of my home building knowledge comes from youth mission trips that I went on. And even then, it wasn't so much the, the framing or the roofing or the drywalling that I learned from. It was the songs. Don't build your house on Sandy Lake. Don't build it too close to the shore. Do you know this one? Clearly not. Well, it may be kind of nice, but you'll have to build it twice. You'll have to build your house once more. And here's the real instruction. You gotta build your house upon a rock, a strong foundation in a solid spot. Well, the storms may come and go, but the peace of God you'll come to know. Well, on the second Sunday of Advent, traditionally the Sunday of peace, we hear Zechariah singing blessing into this newborn's being, laying a strong foundation for John's life who will then go on to prepare the way for Jesus, this promised Savior from the house of David, who will, as we read, give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death and guide our feet in the way of peace. But we're not there yet. I mean, John has just now been born. Jesus hasn't been yet. We are a ways away from making it to the way of peace. And it sure feels that way sometimes. Now maybe it's because the holiday season is supposed to be full of Thanksgiving and Christmas cheer and hope and peace and joy and love, but the bad news seems to hit harder this time of year. And if you watch the news at all, it can feel like peace is a pipe dream. We see wars and armed conflict and political upheaval in countries all across the globe. We see gun violence in our own streets, in our own schools. Division in our country creating discord in the halls of Congress and across our dining room tables as we shout at each other instead of talking with or listening to each other. There are family conflicts that lead to tension and strained relationships and sometimes estrangement. Not to mention the constant noise and activity and busyness of our lives in general. Peace is hard to come by. And that's just peace as, you know, not noisy or busy, not arguing or fighting or killing. Seems we are even farther from God's peace, described in the scriptures as shalom, not the absence of noise or activity or tension or conflict, not really an absence at all, but a presence of compassion and justice, of holiness and wholeness. As one of my co colleagues described it, shalom has to do with the redemption of all things. The healing of the earth, the forgiveness of sins, the reconciliation of peoples, the repaired union of God and the world. This shalom, God's peace, is found when all of God's purposes are realized, when human beings have well-being, 
when we are in right relationship with God and with one another, when in the words of St. Julian of Norwich, all shall be well and all shall be well and all manner of thing shall be well. Or in the words of St. Matthew of McConaughey, when everything is all right, all right, all right. It's just that we know that everything is not all right, or all well, or even always all that good. That kind of peace seems still far off. And as is true with home building, I have learned this lesson, it always takes longer than you think. I've heard it said, I think it was my father-in-law that told me this, when a builder tells you that a house or a project will be done in March, you better ask them what year they're talking about. That peace was far off for Zechariah too, even this blessing that the old man offers, a prophecy of one who would bring God's light and love to those who sit in darkness. Well, it's just that, it's a prophecy. It's for the future. The promised Savior from the house of David is still in Mary's womb. And yet with his words of blessing, Zechariah is laying a foundation for John's life. Who will go on to prepare the way for Jesus. Who will guide us and all into the way of peace. Bringing God's shalom to be at home on earth around us and among us and even in us. You know, on one of those uh, sing-song mission trips years ago, we were working in West Virginia with a community development agency and we were building homes that would be affordable for the people in the community. But when we arrived, the house that we were going to work on wasn't even a house. It was just the foundation with some subflooring on it. So while we were there, we actually framed the rest of the house. We built up the walls. And before we left, as I know a bunch of people maybe who have been on these mission trips may do, we wrote words of blessing. Of course, our names too, but words of blessing on the studs that would be inside the walls. And I remember I wrote, may the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Our hope was that in doing that, even after the house was finished, one, that we would have left our mark there, but two, that those words, that blessing, that peace would still surround and stay with anybody that lived there in some way. Susie and I actually did something similar when we renovated our home 10 years ago. Now remember, I don't know anything about construction, so when I say we renovated our home, I mean we paid somebody to renovate our home. The house was almost condemned when we bought it, so it took six months for us before we could move in when they had to do the work, during which time we lived with Susie's parents. It was a long and trying time. Definitely not a peaceful experience by any stretch of the imagination. I'm talking about the construction work, not living with Susie's parents. They were lovely, and we are so appreciative of it. But at one point during these months, we, meaning the construction workers, discovered some water damage and had to open up a bunch of the subflooring all the way down to the joist, all the way down to the foundation, even. So while it was all exposed, we wrote our names and some words on the joist. But we also learned that they had to replace some of the band board along one entire side of the house. Now, I didn't know what that was, but I found out that it's basically a really thick, long board that secures, that is secured to the foundation. And then all of the floor joists and all of the studs on the wall, basically the entire structure, the entire framework of the house is connected to it. It rests on it. And that's how it is connected to that foundation. That's how the house is supported. In a way, Zechariah's words here are like a band board of blessing. 
His prophetic song connects John's life to the very foundation of God's mercy and frames John's life, which will prepare the way for the advent of God's peace, God's shalom, which will be embodied and alive in the person of Jesus. But of course, we know that a foundation is not a finished house. It's not a home in which you can live. When Susie and I wrote our names on those floor joists, when that band board was being replaced, we were still a long way from being done. We were a long way from everything being fixed and made right. On that mission trip in West Virginia, we left well before that house was habitable or the work was completed. Because homes don't get built overnight. And the fullness of God's peace doesn't happen overnight. We can't just sit around and wait for a peaceful, easy feeling to settle over us or stand idly by and hope and pray that God's purposes will be realized, that God's shalom, that God's peace will happen somehow. No, God's peace is not simply something that we hope and wait for. It's also something we prepare and work for. A few years ago, a friend told me about a question that one of his church members asked during a Wednesday evening discussion during the season of Advent, and it sticks with me every year. The person posed this question to the group, what if we lived as if Jesus was really, actually going to be born this year? How would our lives be different? How would we prepare? What would we do? Well, I think some of us would try to do everything, all at once. The way we prepare for company coming over before a big holiday event or a family gathering, going into overdrive, noticing all the things that aren't right, the picture that's a little crooked, the light bulb that's burned out, the stains on the carpet. And then we try to get all the projects done that we've been putting off. That could be overwhelming. I mean, that's what I would probably do, what I should have been doing all along, but to try and do it all just is intimidating. Which is why, maybe more honestly, we might not do much of anything at all. Because it seems so small compared to all that needs to be done. Because it can be paralyzing to realize how far we are from all that God intends for our lives and for our world. From that home that God intends for us, the one that God intends to build among us and through us and in us. I mean, where would we even begin? The Irish poet John O'Donohue tells a story about his neighbor who years ago set out to build a new home on his land. It was a huge undertaking, and this guy, unlike me, intended to do most of the work himself. And he knew the first step was to strip the sod from his field so he could begin to dig out the foundation. He was out in his field one day doing just that, stripping away that sod, preparing the site, when an old man from town happened by. and This old man blessed his neighbor's work, and he said, You've got the worst of it behind you now. The neighbor laughed, thinking this guy was joking. I've only just started. That's what I mean, the old man said. You have begun. And to make a real beginning is the most difficult act. To put it another way, where or how we begin is not as important as the fact that we begin. Somewhere, somehow. Advent itself is a beginning. It is the beginning of a new church year. So what real beginning could you make this Advent? What could you do in this season and maybe beyond to begin to lay the foundation? To build the kind of world in which God's peace is at home. 
where shalom, where compassion and justice and wholeness and healing and love and joy and hope and peace can come alive through your life. Of course, we can try to pursue that on a large scale, but we could begin smaller. We could take the first step towards reconciliation with someone, to ask for forgiveness, to offer forgiveness, to say, I'm sorry. We could put aside our passive aggressive behaviors. We could kindly call someone on a rude or insensitive comment. We could talk to someone instead of talking about them. We could give people the benefit of the doubt and lead with grace instead of judgment. These might not seem like much, but they are real beginnings. And real beginnings can lead to real transformation steadily and gradually. Kind of the way the sun rises in the morning. The way the dawn breaks upon those who have sat in darkness. And we may find that with God's help and by God's grace, that somehow in some way we will have found our way into the way of peace. That the light and love of God shine all around us and among us and within us and through us. That through a baby born in Bethlehem, God is with us and has made this place, this world, our lives and our hearts home. Amen.
respond to the God who makes a home among us, who wants to be at home within us and be at work through us. And if you would like to respond to that invitation to join in the pursuit of peace and shalom, not only in your life, but in our life together and in the life of our world, we would welcome you gladly and would be thrilled to walk alongside you along this journey of life. So as we stand and sing our closing hymn, I invite you, if you would like to respond publicly, to come forward. I'll be at the front to welcome you and receive you as we stand and sing. Let's sing together. Saying their name wrong this whole time. Y'all come up here and stand with me. And if you need to remember it, it's Cry. Christman. Um, and they come today. They have found a home among you. Um, we have prayed for uh, their little boy, TC, who has been in the ICU. Um, you all, uh, through your generous gifts, have allowed us to provide some meals for them. And um, they have felt that love and that care of this community of faith and um, so we welcome them today and um, uh, if you will welcome them and they also have two others uh, Bryson and I've already forgotten Avery since I y'all my mind is gone today um, and if you will welcome them and receive them into this community of faith will you please affirm that by saying amen amen we are so glad to have y'all with us. You can grab a seat right here, and um, I'll in, invite you to uh, stay up here after the service is over and invite you to come forward and begin the process, continue the process of getting to know them and letting them get to know you and welcoming them. Um, so we are so thrilled that, that you are here and so thrilled that you all have been here to worship with us. So let us go to lay a foundation. For God's way of peace, to join in the work of pursuing God's peace. And as we go to do that good work, we pray that God would give us grace. Grace never to sell ourselves short. Grace to risk something big or something good. Grace to remember that the world is too dangerous for anything but truth. And too small 
or anything but love. So may God take our minds and think through them. May God take our lips and speak through them. May God take our hands and work through them. And may God take our hearts and set them on fire this day, every day, and forevermore.